about, there are a lot of different opinions about. Uh, and, you know, you put two riggers in a room, you have three opinions. Uh, and all of them are going to be right. Uh, so there's lots of juice here, and we're not going to get deep into that juice in the next 90 minutes. Uh, you know, it'd be great to dive deeply into all of these things. I don't think we can do that, uh, but I welcome, and I know Andy does, uh, and Bill is always there and available to continue conversations about stuff that is relevant. So I hope that this is a beginning. Our game plan for today is a very light touch over the top, raising some of the big issues and some of the questions. It is not for anybody, please, a how-to. Don't take what we talk about here and say, okay, I can go do that, please. Uh, it's really just a window into how we can think about making choices and problem solving. Bill's challenge to us was to have fun. Uh, and our challenge to ourselves, speaking for Andy and me, is how to avoid the rabbit holes uh, because we both like to dive deep, as I'm sure everybody else here does. So, Andy, what are what in answer to the question that you raised, what are some of the things that are significantly different about uh, about putting a human being up in the air for the purpose of entertainment? from other sorts of rigging? Well, man, you could write a, and books have been written about what are different difference, but like the, the how you do it is gonna be different. Um, like the, the what you use is gonna be different quite often. You're gonna find exotic hardware and materials that aren't, the arena riggers wouldn't experience. But the main difference that I have found is the who. Um, and the, in, in all other aspects of rigging, the load doesn't have emotions. The load doesn't have opinions. The load doesn't have a mortgage or a family. And that to me is the biggest thing, the biggest shift in uh, attitude when it comes to circus and having a person as the load is um, the, kind of the, not the nuts and bolts of the rigging, but more of the soft skills, the how to communicate with them, how to make sure their needs are met, how to communicate to them when their expectations maybe aren't um, reasonable <laughs> and uh, how to offer them a better solution, maybe a, a different option or how to say to them things like, boy, we really, shouldn't be doing that 10 shows a week. Andy, so I, I'm losing a little bit of your audio. I don't know if that's true for other people as well. Yeah, that, that is true. Uh, Jonathan, can you um, paraphrase for us when, when, when he loses it? I, I, cert I certainly can. Uh, I, uh, Andy, are you still talking? <laughs> no. OK. Um, so the, so we've got these, um, we've got the, the human element, since we're flying human beings, uh, and as, as Andy said, you know, in, if we're doing our arena rigging, usually the load doesn't have the last word. The load isn't our boss in this matter. And the load is our boss here, and, the, and we are in service to the, the person who is putting their life literally on the line. Um, and that's true whether we're flying Peter Pan at a high school uh, or whether we're flying uh, um, pink in an arena. Although, to be clear, we're not going to be talking a lot today about the stuff that Paul Sapsis uh, spoke about. We're really going to stay uh, at a much lower end of the conversation. Uh, um, in terms of the amount of money and technology that, that are involved, and a lot of times uh, in terms of the engineering. Um, so we have this big difference about the people. Uh, and we had Andy also alluded to the fact that we don't have a fixed body of knowledge. This is how we do it. You know, if if I'm 
sorry, I'm reaching the bookshelf. If I'm going to do arena rock and roll rigging, there's the book. That's how to do it. And I can, and I'm going to do it the same way every time as replicably as possible. Uh, with, um, with performance, not only is every situation different, but every performance is different. Uh, and we need to be responsive of that. Things are changing a lot in this world, as we all know. Uh, and when I started, there was a very small cabal of, of magicians who rigged for aerial performance. It was only specialists, and it only happened in special situations. Now it's mainstream, uh, not only theatrically, where kind of every show, every season of every show has some flying gags in it. Uh, but there's also a circus school or an aerial studio, an aerial arts studio on every corner in every city. And there are thousands of people. There's this little one of one of many uh, uh, Facebook groups uh, called Safety in Aerial Arts, which had 60 people in it when I started and now has over 22,000 people uh, in it talking about these issues that we are talking about at lots of different levels. That's very different from what it was. Uh, it's also very different um, because the equipment that we use, Andy talked about a little bit, is not standardized. Uh, and uh, manufacturers often have no clue what we're using it for. So there's a disconnect and there is a tradition of improvisation, of do-it-yourself, of using materials that were designed for other purposes. Uh, and, um, and that is also changing uh, as there has become a market for this stuff. And people are beginning to even uh, introduce, for example, uh, aerial fabric, whether you call them silks or tissues or fabric or whatever, that have a rating on them. That was never happened. And that was never happening before. And it's still a little fuzzy because that stuff is still made not for flying, not for people to do acrobatics on, but for ladies' underwear mostly. Uh, but yet there is a lot of testing. There's a lot of knowledge that exists now that did not exist back then. Uh, well, unlike a rated carabiner, that there's a standard that the manufacturer is expected to meet before they can put a rating on it. There's no standard for rating your fabric. Uh, and it's very rare for a manufacturer to say, I endorse you hanging people from this fabric. So the, the, the lack of standards is absolutely a thing for the equipment. But five years ago, and this is a, a segue here, notice the segue. Five years ago, the first standard in the United States relating to what we are doing uh, um, came into force. And we're going to talk for a minute about that. But before doing that, I just want to kind of give you, because I realize we didn't do this. Bill said we're dividing this into three parts. Uh, and the three parts, the three questions that we're really asking today is we're going to talk a little bit about risk management. We're going to, to ask what how do we know what the loads and forces that our performance is going to apply to the system? And then how do we know that the system is strong enough to support those loads and forces the way we're using them? Those are really the three topics. Uh, and uh, the, but before, even before diving into those, I want to call attention for those who may not be aware that in 2016, for the first time, uh, the ESTA working group, uh, rigging working group, uh, which works under the auspices of the technical, technic, help me out, Bill, technical standards program, uh, yep. and under the auspices of the American National Standards Institute, uh, put into place the very first uh, 
American national standard for flying humans in the entertainment industry. Uh, and there's been a bit of confusion about it. It's been in place about five years. If you heard the Paul Sapsis conversation, he kept referring back and forth to it. There's lots of good stuff in it. I recommend that everybody take a look at it uh, and become familiar with it because there's lots of valuable things in there. And I will add that like other, every other standard, it gets um, reviewed and, and possibly revised every five years. Uh, and this is in the review process right now. Uh, so there will be a new version at some point of it. Uh, but just to, just to give you a little taste, the scope of the standard, the very beginning, talks about what it intends to do. Uh, and I just want to highlight one point about that because there is remaining confusion about it that I would love to dispel. Uh, and that's the yellow highlighted performer flying systems within the scope of this standard include devices and systems of supporting people or components to which people are attached, flying or suspended in the air. The scope goes on to say a lot of other things. Uh, but this, it finishes with this document covers the elements that are common to all types of performer flying, regardless of the style or type of flying performance. Again, whether you're Peter Pan at a high school, you're pink at uh, Madison Square Garden, or you're the Big Apple Circus, uh, or Ringling Brothers, you're Bandaloop dancing down the side of mountains, uh, this is all within the scope of this standard. Uh, and I, again, I recommend that we look at it. We're going to be referring to it uh, a lot. So that's the, uh, that's the standard. We, did somebody want to say something, Bill? Did you? I heard a noise. That wasn't me. OK. OK, so question one. Let's see if question one is shows up next, if I did this right. Nope, where's, there, there it is. Question one, and people who know me know I'm a bit of a one trick pony about this stuff. Uh, I really, really, really like to use the tool of risk assessment and risk reduction as a, not as a bureaucratic requirement or something that the regulations and standards say we have to do, although they do, but as a tool and a filter to look through to help us make good choices. Uh, so just to give you a few little topics, a, a little bit pointers, this is not a deep dive into risk assessment. Uh, Bill may do that someday. I think uh, it's, it's on the agenda for somewhere. Uh, and I recommend people use these tools. One of the, I'm gonna say a couple things about it. One is it's most useful when you do it in advance and not when you're in the action. So it's really worth thinking about, uh, about what those risks, are, risks and hazards are before you get to uh, the situation. Um, you also, it's important, it's important to realize that everybody's risk tolerance and the level of risk that is acceptable is different. Uh, and you have to decide what the appropriate level of risk is uh, in order to behave and make choices appropriately. But fundamentally, what the risk, risk, assessment, risk assessment, risk reduction process is four questions. And the first is what could possibly go wrong here? It's a great question to be asking all the time. What could go wrong? Let's stop before we go into that situation. Let's stop and figure that out. Uh, and we can make a long list of things. Uh, we then need to ask what are the consequences if it does go wrong? Uh, and we need to ask, well, what's the likelihood of it happen? Now we have three things uh, to consider to help us determine what can we do and what should we do to mitigate or to eliminate that risk. Uh, and the risk reduction and risk assessment methodologies 
that I find useful tend to then quantify the answers to those questions. So you can use a chart something like this. Your mileage may vary, and there are lots of different ways of skinning this cat to figure out what's red. Red means stop, and green means go. What's an acceptable level of risk for you? And you can put those in, and then you can figure out, well, what can we do about it? And many of you will be very familiar with this uh, picture of the hierarchy of controls, which really indicates that the most effective way of dealing with a risk is to eliminate it completely. The least effective, and in this context, this is an OSHA drawing, is to use PPE. Um, but you need to think through what are going to be effective ways of dealing with those risks. Uh, and in the world of in the world of flying people, uh, whether it be acrobatic or other forms of flying, there are some things that we know are always going to be part of this inquiry. One of them is that you need to have an actual implementable plan that merely giving uh, giving voice to the risk and identifying it doesn't do the trick. Uh, you absolutely need to figure out the how, not just the what. Well, hang on a second, Jonathan. Okay. You know, when the aerialist is up on the tissue, um, their fall protection plan is don't fall. It's true. So we are, we, but, but we have made a choice of uh, what the appropriate level of risk is. Now, let's say they're up on their, their idea is to go up on a tissue, or the director says, Gosh, I want to do this great act. I've got this, I saw those aerial silk things that Cirque du Soleil uses, and I want to do that. But I, this is a commercial for olive oil. So I want to soak the fabric in olive oil and then have the performer up there. That's a, a different level of risk, right? Is that, is that a gig you actually were on? No. <laughs> it's a, what, what we call a hypothetical, which is a ridiculous example designed to make a point. Um, but so, but they, then we, if we look at what we want to do, and then we say, well, that's a little risky. What can we do about that? We can eliminate it. We can change from, you know, from olive oil to bacon fat because bacon fat is inherently better than olive oil in all situations. Um, or there, or, or what else could we do to mitigate that risk? With uh, so, look, there's the hazard. The hazard, the hazard exists. We have somebody at height, and then there's the risk of falling. We may be. You're right. The the plan is don't fall, but we're also going to say, well, can we put a nice big fat crash mat underneath that person so that if they fall, the risk of injury is mitigated. Minimized. Well, so if I'm the technical director in a venue and I've, we've booked this act to come in and then my producer, my boss walks in and says, holy whatever, the, she's going to fall. We have to stop this. Like that's, that's too much risk. How do you say to that person, that authority, that, that that person who's making that risk has mitigated it enough? How do you know you've done enough? Well, um, ultimately, that's a, a situational question, isn't it? Because, uh, and you have this in a situation where, you, let's say you have an, uh, a, an authority having jurisdiction, AHJ, whose opinion about what your, uh, what your, um, practices are for any given risk, whether it be the risk of not having a good egress or not having handrails or, or any of them, or using, let's say, using pyro on stage with flammable foam o over it, whatever that risk is, somebody has the last word. And you started by saying there is communication and talking uh, and this is a collaborative process, which it is. Somebody's going to have the last word. You can engage in the process together. And what's often been helpful for me is to have the, the risk assessment 
risk management process be itself a collaborative process to help everybody get on the same wavelength about what's the acceptable level of risk and are we doing the appropriate things? And the element that you touched on earlier, that that conversation happens with the authority prior to the rehearsal when they can come in and be shocked by the person hanging there by their own strength. And then the other observation is you gotta, you gotta trust them. Like, and that's a difficult thing to do, especially when it's uh, someone that you haven't worked with before, like you're booking in an act, um, you have to trust them by their reputation. And it's ch very challenging to assess that they have mitigated the risks through training and health and uh, conditioning and all of those things that acrobats need to do, especially for a novice like me, I'm just a rigger. Um, <laughs> If I may interject, and I, and, and I know I said I wasn't going to, but this seemed like a good opportunity. Um, one of the things that can be done that will help management, which is looking for reassurance in a way that they understand. If you're bringing in an act to a venue, you're going to want to bring as much paperwork as you possibly can to present to that management person. That would include a risk assessment uh, uh, document. But it also, in my opinion, I don't know how common this is, but in my opinion, it should include uh, a relatively detailed history of the performers so that it's not just, well, I work with Big Apple and I work with the Moscow Circus, I did this and this, but, you know, it, it, a detail of the act and how much rehearsal time has gone in, you know, generalities generally speaking that sort of thing but something that speaks to the management folks in a way that they can understand so that they can make a you know an, an, an intelligent decision an informed decision going back to my corner now for for me uh i mean i totally agree with what bill's saying it's super hard to vet people um but you can ask them intelligent Questions. And one of them is like, well, does your rigging comply with the uh, 1.43 standard? And if you just get dead air on the phone or a funny look or like, oh, what's that mean? Well, that informed, that gives you some information about their level of skill. And then the other uh, element that I, I find uh, is indicative of the level of expertise is asking them about rescue plan. Um, and uh, I think I'm jumping ahead a couple slides here, but the um that what goes up you have to have a plan to get them down right do it, do it andy we're hit, we're there <laughs> uh that uh kind of frighteningly too often rescue is a bit of an afterthought like you're in such a rush to get the show together that you think about how to make it happen and not the risk of what could go wrong um and Often rescue planning is, is, is more in line of what we're not gonna talk about, the automated end of uh, rigging and performer flying and circus, but it's very relevant to uh, the manual uh, systems as well. Um, and like uh, an example is just if that person, it gets entangled in a way that they're not expecting, um, how are they gonna get down? And if the rigor that you're advancing this act with says, uh, well, you guys got a ladder, right? Okay, that's that that is potentially a very valid rescue plan, um, you know, but it shouldn't be made in the moment of, oh crap, how do we get that person down? Um, and the potential for those things going wrong is what you f flesh out in that risk management, uh, risk assessment plan. And then the other really crucial element that I think is potentially an afterthought in, in, I can think of an example from this year in traditional circus where it was, is uh, the medical response plan. Um, because there is always a risk of unintended dismount uh, and or a catch going wrong, or even just, uh, you know, I can trip and fall and have a bad uh, landing on my head or whatever. Um, so asking them what they're planning for medical procedures are uh, is another level of 
figuring out what their level, their expertise level is and how, how really, how they've thought through this. And then if they say, oh, well, you know, we're going to call 911, like, okay, well now it's on the venue to say, okay, well, I'm going to make sure that we have an appropriate response before we can allow this to happen before these, we need to miss, uh, mitigate that risk. And part of the, part of the quandary here and different from a lot of other entertainment rigging uh, is how do you know, and Andy's given us some clues, how do you know that the person you're dealing with or the person responsible for this act or the person responsible for rigging this act knows what they're doing? I'm going to use a word of art. How do you know that they are either qualified or competent to uh, do this? Now, in other entertainment rigging, we have this nice entertainment rigging certification program, uh, entertainment technology certification program, which does provide a tool to recognize whether you're, the person you're talking to is in, does in fact know what they're doing. Do they have the requisite level of experience and knowledge? Uh, and you will recall that the, um, the definition, the that is used in the United States, regulatory and otherwise, for a qualified person is, this is paraphrased, someone who either by virtue of a, um, a diploma, a, certif a certification, or through extensive experience is able to be an expert. I'm just very paraph paraphrasing there. Uh, uh, for entertainment rigging, and Bill can speak for hours about this, the EPCP certification provides some assurance there that you're dealing with somebody who is qualified or at least competent to do what they're, what they're doing. Uh, that certification, by its terms, specifically does not say anything about whether you're qualified to put a human being up in the air. Specifically, so the fact that you have a, an ETCP rigor on the job does not necessarily mean that they have experience with putting an aerialist up on a fabric and thinking through all of the things that one has to think through that are different. It makes it a little more challenging to know. And as the TD in the venue, it makes a little, it a little bit more challenging to, to judge. Should we wrap up this section and take a couple questions? Because I saw there, there's some good ones. There are, just two other, there are just two other things, Andy, that we have that are part that are always part of risk assessment uh, for what we're talking about today, putting people in the air. And one of them in common with, uh, with um, other rigging is we have to think about safe work practices. When we have to uh, we have to think about are we protecting ourselves and our colleagues appropriately as we're doing this work at height. Uh, and that's no different from, uh, from the rest of the entertainment rigging world. There is a cultural difference and a cultural lag because uh, frankly, in traditional circuses where I spend a lot of my time, the uh, cultural acceptance of uh, rigorous uh, fall protection uh, approaches uh, is not as widely, has not taken root as widely yet. That's a change that's happening over time. Uh, but we have to do that and we have to do it as part of our risk assessment. The other thing that we have to do, and we do it in regular entertainment rigging, uh, but it's really critical and called out in the standards for uh, for aerial performance, and that is to have a rigorous program of inspection. Uh, and that is a way of managing risk. So those are just a few things. Again, not a deep dive into risk assessment, but, uh, but hopefully some food for thought. Does that make sense? Yes, everybody's nodding, great. Uh, so this is a time to break and take and take some questions, have a little discussion. Uh, we're going to manage the time uh, on this, but uh, Bill and Sarah, do we have things in the chat? Yeah. 
Well, yeah, we there's a couple there's a couple of things. Um, and I am being judicious, folks, and I apologize if I don't get to your question. But Pedro has asked, to what extent should we or can we let the performer take risks that he or she believes they're capable of? Um, and I'm going to add that I think that you know, if there are real world uh, examples, that would be really helpful. Andy, you got one right off. You got a. You got a. Um, you yeah, got I mean, I have a. It's um the short. I mean, it's not a great answer, but the answer that I would give to Pedro is it. It's how much do you trust them, and that comes from experience and working with them and uh, believing in them and vetting them. Um, but it also comes down to pr planning and having uh, an agreement on who can say no, because we're all in this cult of the show must go on. And that's all of our instincts. And I've fallen into that trap and I know performers have fallen into that trap. And I very much fear that some of the injuries I'm aware of are really due to that, uh, like saying, yeah, I can do it even though I haven't slept enough, even though I'm fatigued. Um, so it's very much situational, but I have a great example of, um, you know, I bought so maybe like 20 tickets to come see uh, the Cirque du Soleil show for my family uh, and my extended family. And uh, that happened to be the day that the, um, the Wheel of Death artist just was not, was not there. He, uh, uh, he was just fatigued. Um, and the, one of the physiotherapists on the show spotted it, watched them, asked them about it. They were like, I'm good, I'm good. But on her authority, she said, no, you're not. And he didn't argue because he's a professional. Um, and I had that authority as a rigor on those shows to say, no, you're not, we're not doing this. And you know, that's part of the pre-planning of saying who can, who can pull the plug. And then the other thing about assessing um, if they're good, like, are they gonna be able to do this? Is the rehearsals. Um, like you can put the mitigation factor in for rehearsals, like the big crash mat that they're not gonna perform in, perform with. Well, let's put that under them as they warm up and make sure that they're good and you can see the act. And uh, I'm a rigger, not a coach. So I lean heavily on the experience of the acrobatic coaches that I work with uh, to say if an individual is safe or not. Okay, cool, thank you. Uh, next question comes from Matthew Thomas and um, he wanted to know who's carrying the insurance risk. And um, I think Neil's hand just went up in the air. Uh, <laughs> but, and I answered Matthew in the chat that said the simple answer is everyone. Um, do you wanna, uh, this is a rabbit hole that would take forever, but if, do you wanna touch, either one of you wanna, touch base on this from your experience um, for just a minute? Well, sure. Uh, the it, it is a rabbit hole. And your answer, Bill, was absolutely correct. Everybody needs to protect themselves and their and their interest that I try and really separate questions of kind of legal liability uh, um, from questions of being safe, managing risk, and being prudent. Uh, if you, however, even if you do everything right, accidents happen sometimes, and you're going to get sued for it most likely. Uh, and if you don't have insurance that covers that activity, uh, you're, you're uh, putting your financial uh, well-being and that of your family at risk. So yeah, it, it's everybody and anybody. Yeah, I will, I will add to that, that in the larger picture, uh, insurance companies aren't really interested in you and your, your Dodge Dart and your double wide trailer home. Um, they're gonna go after somebody within the within the scope of the project who has much deeper, much deeper, uh, excuse me, pockets. Sure. So if you want to avoid being sued, be poor. Well, you're going to get sued anyway. 
trust me i i know this you're gonna get sued anyway uh you're just not gonna have a lot to throw into the pot yeah you're gonna get you're gonna get you're you're if unless you are directly responsible and you know i mean it's clear that you screwed it up um if you don't have anything they're not gonna they're not gonna spend a lot of time with you I like to think about it in two ways. Like how are these decisions, the decision I'm making right now when I'm rigging, if I, if I feel like, how would I feel discussing this decision in a court with a lawyer? Uh, would I feel confident in my decision or would it be like, I don't know. And if you're in the, I don't know, range, uh, really shine a light on it. Um, and then the other thing is, you know, the best thing is to avoid the accident, right? So I definitely preach and I, I think about this all the time is, uh, would I put my family on that uh, rigging of mine? And my answer is always yes, because that's the level of care I bring to it. Um, but that's the culture of circus as well, is that your, your family is on it. Uh, and so, you know, dad taught you how to rig it and your sister's hanging from it. Um, so that's that's part of circus. Okay, I have one more, and then we can go on. And Brian, I think it's it says Brian R, but I believe it's well. I'll leave it at Brian R. He may not want his last name in. Um, does suspension trauma pathology? Let me read that again. Does suspension trauma slash pathology come into play for situations where a harness is isn't involved? <laughs> Perhaps it's a wrist loop or something similar. It, it surely could. And it's part of the reason that your emergency plan needs to uh, be timely. Uh, um, it surely could, you know, the orthostatic intolerance, uh, folks know more or less about that. But if you are unconscious, uh, if you're unable to move your legs, uh, or wiggle around or do something to keep your blood flow going, you are at risk. And that can be true in lots of different uh, uh, performer flying scenarios with or without harnesses. Right. Uh, I think one of the classic examples of that in a non-traditional situation, I couldn't tell you what team it was or even what sport they were playing, but it was in an arena and the mascot was... Um, rappelling down out of the steel as part of the opening gag got about halfway down and went out he pat they he they uh she passed out and it was clearly an orthostatic intolerance situation um you know it can happen it can happen in many many different circumstances and the response you know how quickly you succumb to that changes from one person to another but the key, I think, to reduce the, the, the chance of orthostatic intolerance is uh, movement, especially in your, your lower extremities, uh, moving your legs and, 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 and your, your butt and everything else around. The, uh, uh, Brian mentioned uh, hand loops and uh, another op apparatus would be straps where you're suspended uh, by your wrist and it relies on actual grip strength um and if you are suspended there for longer than you expect and it's not that much longer like 90 seconds you know you can start to lose that grip we just lost him again you can you can start to lose that grip now in some cases you know you're going to be held by the safety loop uh and in other cases it's a it's a potential fall down go boom which is generally bad. Are you back? Right. I don't know. Am I back? Yes, you are now. Okay, good. Perfect. Cool. Does that res does that respond to those questions? Right. Okay. Um, I, I I do have one more. Um, I'm sorry, but I'm going to throw this one out real quick. Daniel Daniel asks, how would you approach some of the you know the lesser experienced touring acts that come through without paperwork? and sometimes have language barriers um yeah it's a it, it's a very uh very real scenario uh and if you're a if you're a venue uh uh even if even 
the well, the, so the language barrier is one thing, and the experience and the lack of documentation, the different cultures and appropriate uh, or, or approaches to risk, all play in. Uh, but I, and I think ultimately it really goes back to what Andy's been preaching, uh, which is it's preparation, communication, advancing uh, more communication, and determining what level of risk is acceptable. Uh, and that's why uh, it's not only an educated consumer is our best customer, but that's why uh, we spend a lot of time, or I spend a lot of time talking with TDs, with college theater programs, uh, even with IA locals that are not responsible for creating or even necessarily rigging these gags, uh, but they are they do ultimately need to know that what's being done is appropriate. Uh, and I don't know that there's a magic bullet for it other than the kind of communication that Andy's been talking about. I'd love to hear more tricks and if people have approaches that they've used that success that are successful, put them in the chat. I'd like to learn from them. Yeah, I'm going to offer one real quick, and then we can go on. But when I when we put to, when we're doing a project that has risk involved in it, um, it's in my contract with the client that I have the final say. All right, if you know, they can they can provide all the documentation and and details, risk assessment, and all that in advance. But then when you get to do the show, it's different. It's changed something you know they've altered something because they wrote the risk assessment at the beginning of the tour you know a year and a half ago and things have evolved over over time um you need someone who everybody knows has the final say and you know it's a, it's a it's a contractual thing and it's a communication thing yeah and there there may be multiple people who can say, or they may be one person with the final say but they're are a bunch of people, uh, and it's a fairly large bunch of people that have the right to say no at any point, starting with the performer. But uh, um, I'll give an example from Cirque du Soleil uh, on a show that I was involved with. You know, the, the, every technician backstage needed to be, needed to clearly understand that they had the right to press the big red stop button, which stopped the whole show cold at any time, that they have that power. Uh, and uh, while there is, you know, there are chains of command, uh, it's very important. Uh, if, the, if the performer is standing at the edge and about to be cleared to fly, they could say, you know, I just don't feel like it. It's not, something's not right. I don't know what it is. I'm not going. And they have the, the authority and the right to do that. That's, a, that's, that's spinning off yeah. on what I'm saying there. Cool. And spinning off, let's spin off to the next of our topics. And then the next, uh, the next of our topics is question two. Uh, and question two is one of the big things that differs from other entertainment rigging. Do we have different loads and forces? Now, this is kind of the first question you have to ask in order to figure out, is, the, is my system going to be adequate to support, the, to support the act, to support the loads that we're putting on the act? So in order to do that, we have to understand those loads and forces. And those loads and forces are inherently different from, uh, or, or different, I'll say, inherently different or different in degree from uh, the loads and forces uh, of uh, a rock and roll show or other entertainment rigging, or rigging where the, the sound system that you're hagging isn't dancing at the same time as it's as the show is going on. Um, so understanding that is one of the things that we've talked about a lot over the years and people understand a lot better now than they did before. Uh, and there are different, because there are different kinds of things 
that are going on. The biggest of those things is movement. And so we're dealing with dynamic forces. Now, this, this idea ought to be familiar to everybody. Uh, but just to review, if we go back to Isaac Newton's uh, three laws of motion, we have one of them that's called inertia. We have one of them that we refer to as the effect of, of acceleration. Uh, and then there are equal and opposite reactions. But remember that to get a static load moving or to stop it, you have to apply force that's greater than the weight of that object. St and the shorter the time it takes to do that starter, starting and stopping, the greater the force you need. Now that's, that's a description of aerial performance is there's a lot of starting and stopping and hence, there are loads which are not necessarily intuitive. The biggest one of these are the forces related to acceleration and deceleration, uh, um, which if they happen really, really fast, specifically talking about deceleration most of the time, if they happen really, really fast, or what some people say instantaneously, we call shock loads. Uh, they usually happen as a function of a sudden stop. Uh, and they're hard to get your hands around, but they play a big role in thinking about rigging for aerial performance. Really, the best ways of figuring them out is to try it out and see. Uh, hopefully, you're trying it out and see under, uh, under controlled circumstances. So if you want to know what that particular act is going to produce, uh, you're going to, you're, first you're gonna estimate, and we're gonna talk about that, so that you know that your conditions are generally uh, going to be okay. And then hopefully you'll be able to actually measure it by using something like a load cell or an old school dynamometer. Uh, the picture that you have up here is actually in, uh, in um, Brazil. Uh, where we were testing on fabric, a particular kind of um, uh, drop acrobatic act, and we had the load cell hooked up. And you'll see that 329, that's in kilograms. Uh, so this, uh, so that's about, oh, who? somebody do the math for me, about 650, 700 pounds, somewhere in there, uh, of force at the bottom of that drop. Uh, the performer weighed about 130 pounds arbitrarily. Uh, so you could see there was a substantial multiplier as a result of that dynamic force. Uh, and that is extremely typical of performance, of aerial performance. So we're in traditional entertainment rigging. We're all taught, we're going to avoid shock loads completely. And we do all kinds of tests. This is Rocky Paulson doing a demonstration, a shock load demonstration, where he's dropping a weight with a load cell attached uh, and showing what the, what the shock load or what the, the, uh, the, that instantaneous load force is generated by that drop. And we've done this a lot in a lot of different ways. Uh, one of the, the the pictures that I like to show, actually, we did with Bill Sapsis at a workshop in um, uh, Philadelphia, I believe. Uh, and it's hard to see, but you, you, what you had is a situation where you had a small weight. I don't remember the exact amount of the weight that you used, Bill, but it could have been like... It was about 200 pounds, if I remember correctly. Uh, it may, be, may have been a little less than that, but let's take that, because I'm looking at the scale at the bottom. Uh, but the it ended up producing a shock load of over 2,500 pounds. Uh, and then having all these nice oscillations, I just, I think it's a great picture. Uh, so it was more than 10 times the... Uh, the static weight. Uh, and if you've heard that 10 times, 
that that number should ring a bell and we'll come kind of come back to it uh, in the next section. Uh, just as an example, let's see, and we've done this, this kind of testing with performers doing different things a lot of times, uh, and that's definitely a rabbit hole. Uh, but just to give you an example uh, of a way that's useful to thinking of, think about it for estimation purposes, this is not real measurement and these numbers never work in the real world. I'm going to give you an example of a performer who weighs about 100 pounds uh, and performing a drop on, on an apparatus, doesn't matter which apparatus for the moment. Uh, it's a, uh, imagine a drop which has 10 feet of free fall and then the performer is caught. Uh, and we know or we guess that the system that's catching the performer has about one foot of stretch in it. With those three pieces of information, we can do a rough ballpark estimate of what that loading is going to be when that performer hits the bottom. Uh, and I really do want to emphasize that it's that this is an estimate. It doesn't happen this way in the real world. But there's a formula, and you can find this formula all over the place, including in Harry's books, in Jay's books, in everybody's books, um, uh, as a way of thinking about um, about shock loading or dynamic loading, extreme dynamic loading. And the again, the only three things that you need are the weight, the dropping distance, uh, and the stopping distance. Uh, and if you plug in numbers with that 100 pound performer, you can do the, the algebra easily in lots of different ways. Uh, you find out that that performer may end up around 1,100 pounds at the bottom or slightly more than 10 times their weight. Uh, and that's borne out by tests like the lo various load cell tests that we do. It's not typical of acrobatic performance because there are lots of things that mitigate that impact load, including time, including elasticity, including the fact that your body is is dissipating loads. That's a whole a whole rabbit hole. But the 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 takeaway is that the applied force is a lot greater than uh, than what the static weight is. And that if you don't take that into account, you're going to run into trouble. Jonathan, I got a question. Yes, sir. How do you measure the stopping distance? You, you, generally speaking, you don't. Uh, and generally speaking, if you, as soon as you introduce the word measure, I'm going to say, get your load cell out. Uh, but you can estimate your stopping distance from experience. Uh, and you also can think about it as a relative matter. So if I'm doing a performance on, let's say, uh, oh, I don't know, um, barbed wire. Let's say I'm doing an aerial dance on barbed wire or chain or something with very low elasticity. I, I'm going to guess a very low number. If I'm doing a performance on bungee, I'm going to know that it has a lot more and I'm going to make a guesstimate and that's going to get me somewhere close into the ballpark enough to know what I'm dealing with. Now, to kind of use that to jump ahead, the other answer that I have, Andy, is that if you have to be precise about this, if you're in a situation where you have to be precise, you're probably doing, you should probably think about other alternatives because we don't want to be close to the edge. What we want to do is we want to have plenty of room for stuff to be different or to go wrong before the system says fall down, go boom. So if an estimate is not close enough, maybe you need to rethink the methodology and get yourself further away from that edge where precision matters, frankly, less. So when I'm advancing the show and I'm kind of specking the gear and making sure that my beams have the capacity to hold up this aerial act 
And I asked them, how much load are you putting on? What sort of answers am I going to get? <laughs> you get the whole range. You, why don't you answer your own question there? Uh, well, you're unlikely to get this. Fine. You're, I, I, my experience is you're unlikely to get this uh, equation, uh, certainly. Um, you're going to be lucky, very lucky, if they have actually measured it uh, with a load cell. Um, and more often than not, you're going to get, well, I, I weigh 100 pounds, so I think it's like 500 pounds. Um, and how, how, I mean, it's an honest question to me. How do you evaluate that? Like, oh, I think it's about 500 pounds. And I know what the traditional circus answer is. It's just make it bigger, weld more metal to it, uh, use a half inch plate, not a quarter inch plate, like just make it so bomber that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to sleep at night. Um, and I don't, you I mean, there's certain things you can't translate that into arena rigging and, and theater rigging. Uh, so it's a, it's a difficult question. So in, in, and in part three of our conversation, which we'll get to very, very soon after another set of questions, we're going to talk about how strong does it need to be? Uh, and how much room do you need to have uh, um, because of uncertainty, among other things? Uh, and uh, we, we'll, we will talk, I promise, about design factors uh, or factors of safety uh, and, or, or factors of ignorance, if you will. Uh, and we will um, look at different ways of trying to answer that question. That's a big conversation. I, uh, let me... Let me just say that I, I feel kind of inadequate uh, to be able to address and to give justice to the questions and issues. Um, Bill, can I do, do a, little, a little plug here? Uh, because Eric Rouse and I are going to be starting a series of we're going to be doing eight hours on these topics starting next week. Uh, um, and folks are welcome to, to sign up for those programs. Uh, uh, if Eric is there, could you put a little information about that in here? Because we're going to do case studies and scenarios for eight hours uh, every two weeks for the next couple months, I think. Uh, uh, and uh, and and I would I'd love to grapple more with those questions. Jonathan, you asked me if you could uh, if you you just asked me a minute ago if you could make um, a plug for this other program. Uh, the okay. answer is no. <laughs> okay, then, then I won't. Then I won't. All right. I, I I need to point out that uh, it is um, three fifteen yeah. Eastern time. I've got. I'm, um, I'm watching the clock here and we're going to be in trouble, but we're going to do the best we can. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, so to point out that there are other things to think about include in addition to that. And, and this is just, uh, just sort of a throwaway here, but remember that if you're using a pulley system, uh, you have multipliers and resultant forces to think about that sometimes like often, don't get taken into a, uh, into account. Uh, you also have uh, the need to take into account what are the bridal, what are the implications of the bridling that everybody is going to do. Uh, and in our world, they're going to do it a lot of times because they're trying to get the maximum height for the for the gag, and so they're figuring out how they can how they can get that point as high as possible. Uh, and both the resultants and the bridles are, are kind of bite you in the butt things that uh, that come up in the real world that folks have to think about. A Andy, do you have anything to add about those? Uh, are the, that slide, is that your closet? Uh, it, no, it's Bill's closet. <laughs> um, <laughs> to, to, to throw out a couple uh, like useful things for that, that technical director who is trying to assess how much force is really going to be there, um, there are actually now some resources out there, um, some published studies, one by uh, Marion 
Cosin. Am I saying it right, Jonathan? Cosin. 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 Um, and uh, actual real life measurements and data of actual real life aerialists on actual uh, apparatuses that you're going to encounter. Um, and some of the some of the answers are really surprising, like up to eight G's. Um, and G force is not a uh, a uh, unit that riggers normally talk about a lot, but it's intuitive for me to think about multiples of body weight, and that's exactly what a G force is. So uh, multiples of body weight or G forces that an artist can produce with the big tricks now. At my, you know, my entertainment theater background is that we avoid shock loads, right? Shock loads are bad. They're unexpected. In circus, shock loads are the act. They're expected. They're planned. That's the trick. That's the entertainment value. Um, so it's, it definitely becomes a different conversation about how much force it's going to be. And you're going to encounter that the, the talent doesn't really know or they're having a guess. So you can arm yourself with some of these other data points that are out there like that, that study and say, oh, well, this artist on a tissue says that they're only really generating three Gs and check and say, oh, well, that, that drop looks pretty big and that might be a lot more. Um, and take that into account when you're doing your planning. Great. The, the reason that I have this slide from Bill's closet up here is simply to point out that one of the things that's different uh, about what we do is that we are often dealing with concentrated point loads uh, and that thinking about, about the, the impact of concentrated point loads, whether you're talking about stiletto heels or whether you're talking about D to D ratios, which is essentially the same conversation, uh, has a lot of implications in what we're doing and always something you need to think about uh, as, you're, as you're planning and as you're rigging this stuff. Um, uh, this is, Bill, if you can line up uh, some questions, because we're at that point, I will say that this is an example. I'm, I have a real world example of the kind of stuff that we're doing and the problems. So, because it starts with what does the director want? Well, the director wants a dancing woolly mammoth right there. Uh, and what do we do? Okay, so we're gonna run a line between the two of them. Uh, and then we're going to have that woolly mammoth dance, uh, which is a very concentrated, that's not a woolly mammoth, that's a, an African element, elephant. Um, uh, woolly mammoths are a measure of, uh, a unit of measure. Uh, but we're going to have uh, a concentrated point load that has implications for the whole system. Uh, so that that was for fun. And I think we're up for questions, Bill. If you've got some, you're muted. You're muted. Unmute myself. There we go. Um, yeah, folks, you saw it first. I was muted. Um, Greg, Greg Vinci has a, 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 a problem that he's looking uh, for an answer on and uh, he saw a circus rig single points for female acrobats to hang from and perform on each house had rigging points that were rated at 500 pounds the acrobats themselves weighed 100 pounds and he doesn't know the weight of the associated hardware was this safe um, well I, it, I, th I think it's a loaded question but you know Okay, but in um, order to answer the question, you have to know what rated means. Does rated mean, as Jay Glaram used to say, when will the sucker blow up? Or is rated a working load limit that then has a design factor or a safety factor applied to it? So we need a little more information in order to be able to answer the question. Uh, and that's the topic we're coming to, so that's great. Right. Uh, Pamela has asked, why can some tricks be done with no net? What about what about it? What about? I'm I'm sorry. What mitigates the risk? Andy, you want to go? 
Uh, well, I mean, I'll start with a little story that uh, on Kuza, uh, the Tightwire started its run uh, with no net and the Kiros family had been performing like that for decades with no net. And that's part of their act, right? The risk is part of the entertainment. And uh, the Canadian version of OSHA basically took it to surf and was like, yeah, you're going to need a net for that. Um, and there had to be a compromise made. Uh, and there's a net now. Um, the, I guess the answer to Pamela's question is, that's a really hard answer for a rigor to say. Like, I can't assess the skill level of the acrobat. Um, I can uh, assess the forces that are gonna be put on the net and whether that's gonna catch a fall safely. Um, but the, the whether or not to use a safety mitigation, those are conversations that you're gonna have to be a part of. And, and, that, and that is part of the risk assessment, risk reduction process to determine yeah. what appropriate mitigation there is. Uh, there are some acts where the presence of a net makes the act, you can't do the act that way. There are others where like flying trapeze, traditional flying trapeze, there's always a net. The net is part of the act. Uh, um, there might be other ways of mitigating risk but that's, that is the way, the way it's done. Uh, we use a lot of airbags uh, sometimes too as, uh, as uh, mitigation devices. With a lot of aerial dance uh, where, where you are connecting the floor to the air and there's a lot that happens on the ground and smooth transitions to the air Nets are impractical, and so you have to look for other means of mitigation uh, and, and evaluate the risk. Bill, you got another one? I don't think we can um, do that. Greg was asking, uh, you know, coming back to the, his question, looking for an answer. I put my answer in the chat, which just to catch you up on, says that you're correct, Jonathan, we don't have enough information. And when we don't have enough information, then the answer should be, no, it is not safe. You should not do it. I would if turn you that- have information, You should not be doing the, um, the gag. In a real life example, I would turn that question around where the rider comes in and says uh, that the act needs a point supplied by the venue that is rated for 500 pounds. What, what does that sentence mean to me as a rigor? Um, you know, is that, at, you know, I can say that, you know, the engineer says I can hang 500 pounds of truss off this point. At what design factor? Is that an appropriate design factor for human load as well? And that's the real life example you're gonna see with circus rigging coming into the other types of venues like a ballroom where they say maybe just because their teacher told them like oh the point has to be 2,000 pounds and when you start to ask them like well what design factor what uh you know is that working load uh those sort of questions they might not be able to answer those in the language that we use so let, let's use that because i'm very conscious of the time uh um, let's use that to transition, Bill, if it's okay, into, into our final chapter here. Yes, please. Uh, so the, the final chapter is the, the question that we're going to ask, uh, I'm just going to, there it is, is the system strong enough? How do we know? Is the system strong enough to support the loads and forces the way we're using them? Uh, and the standard E1.43 starts to give us answers. There are lots of different stuff about design factors in the standard in different places but the one i'm gonna gonna pick on is it says load bearing hardware shall be designed and selected with a minimum design factor of 10 times working load limit we'll find out what that means in just a second six times characteristic load and three times peak load now what, what do we mean by that the it, if you look in the definitions of the standard they define the working load limit as, as the maximum weight. That would be the weight of the performer and uh, the uh, uh, and apparatus, associated apparatus, that the user is 
allowed to apply. That's your 100 pound aerialist with a 25 pound trapeze. Uh, the characteristic load now adds the dynamic force to it, the expected dynamic force, the maximum force. So it includes the working load, the static load, if you will, uh, the self weight, uh, and the forces due to inertia, remember that word in dynamics, in normal use. So that's what we measure or estimate. And we know that that 100 pound aerialist is going to produce somewhere in the neighborhood of 600 pounds. I'm just picking that number now semi-arbitrarily uh, for what they're planning to do. Uh, the third word, peak load, is, has a special meaning in the standard. And that special meaning means the worst thing that could possibly happen if something goes wrong. And it applies much more to automated rigging where there's fast stuff, where stuff can stop fast. But it can also, you can also imagine situations where a performance is going to produce uh, more than what is expected. Uh, and remember what I said that the standard says we need to be 10 times, we need to be all of 10 times, because it's and, 10 times the working load limit or the static weight, six times the characteristic load, and three times the worst possible thing you can imagine. Uh, in the real world of acrobatics, where people are producing high dynamic forces, as opposed, say, to the Peter Pan, the world of Peter Pan and typical theatrical performer flying where those forces are minimized, it's generally, even though people remember that 10 times number, it's generally the six times characteristic load that is the one that is the one that's going to govern. So in other words, let's say our performer is generating a characteristic load of 600 pounds. We have to multiply that by six and we have to make sure that all of the load bearing hardware is at least going to withstand six, ti six times six, that's 3,600 pounds before, uh, before it fails. Uh, and I want to talk, I'd love to talk about what failure means, but we're not going to. Uh, that's a whole other conversation. Um, so that's the way the, that, that's the way the American standard approaches the question. There are other ways and there may be more sophisticated ways. Uh, and if um, Brian Donaldson were speaking, he could talk about some of those. Uh, um, they involve a deeper dive into what is the, what is the dynamic factor that is likely to be produced by this specific act. Uh, but we're not going to go there today. Andy? Let's see where we're going. Well, if, if you ask, you know, if you ask the aerialist what their characteristic load is, you're going to get that same dumb look. Like they, that's not a term, that's not even a term that's widely, it's becoming more widely understood in rigging. Um, but it's a, it's a word from that standard. It means a very specific thing and it's a well-defined term, but when you're talking about communicating with the acrobat, that might not be a, a data point, a piece of information that you're going to easily be able to get from them. Um, the, um, the peak load idea, that, that three to one, that worst case, we, it, it's almost always automation that Jonathan said, but it is part of your risk analysis to think about what the worst case scenario could be and it's, it's that unintended thing. And what I think that maybe that I try to think about is sometimes what could be the worst possible thing that they could do and generate the most force. And it's probably not measured, right? But like, what if they, like a tissue is usually two, uh, right? Two pieces of fabric and they're usually grabbing onto both of them. Well, what if they mess up and they catch themselves just by one? That's very realistic. Uh, you know, and so that's when I do my analysis that that one leg of it has to be able to support that peak load. 
uh, at least one time. So it, it's now 3.30 by my clock, which is our scheduled ending time. We've actually covered pretty much the content. I have a, a bunch of pictures that I was gonna show for discussion. Bill, how do you wanna handle? Do you want, uh, I know some people have to leave. We can continue. We can, we can, we can continue the conversation. Um, uh, for pretty much as long as we want. Um, although I'm sure some of us might be thinking about, you know, taking a short break, but, uh, <laughs> but um, no, we can continue. And those of you who have to go, please do so. Um, in this kind of after session here, I would, I would hope to see more questions from the, uh, from the assembled masses so that we can respond to specific questions that they may have. Um, and and while, we can continue. while we're doing that, I'm going to kind of scroll through a little bit of slideshow stuff that just may be interesting and tease you about other things that you might want to talk about or provoke questions. So do you have some questions there ready to go, Bill? I got a couple that are just coming in. Um, and Simon asks a great question. Thank you, Simon. And I don't know how to answer it. Uh, he asks how did the standard decide on you know uh, uh 10 times six times and three times you know where did those where did those numbers come from so i wasn't in the room where it happens i don't think there was anybody here or looking around the table who was in the room however i will say that that task group was filled with really smart people including a number of engineers it was led by uh, Bill Gorlin, uh, right. um, who, uh, who were very rigorous about numbers. If you look at the standard, which is 70 pages or so of wonderful language, it also contains a lot of information about what the human body can stand. There's one of my favorite slides from the standard talks about how many G, what are the G forces that an eyeball can withstand. I just love the the image. I should be able to find it, but I'm not going to. But um, the only answer that I can give is uh, smart people, a lot of time and a lot of compromise, because I know that this was a question that they wrestled with quite a lot. Let me uh, let me let me add something to that. Um, engineering here in the United States, uh, professional engineers, i.e. licensed engineers, have a very strict code that they have to follow when they are doing, you know, their evaluations and reviews of different sets of circumstances. And as, as you can imagine, they're pretty comprehensive. Um, those rules, those requirements came into play as they were developing this particular standard. Um, uh, you know, and, and I'm sure that there was a considerable amount of conversation to get to 10, 6, and 3. Um, now, I will say that, it, it, that, that um, the process of review is going on now, and Bill, Bill Gorlin is also a part of that process. Um, one of the things that was recognized and broadly recognized is that when that standard was developed, there was a lot of focus on automated high-end performer flying. Uh, it was around the time or after the time of our friend Spider-Man taking his flights uh, around Broadway. Uh, and, um, uh, and the consideration of acrobatic, specifically acrobatic focused activity sort of took a back, uh, a back stage to that. I'm not talking out of school because this is the way Bill Gorlin tells the story as well. Uh, and this time uh, around, there's going to be some hard looking at those design factors and how well they apply uh, to uh, high dynamic force uh, um, acrobatic style flying. Does that help? Okay. Scott's got a, Scott Henkels has a question that I think is, um, is appropriate. Um, you know, you, Jonathan has suggested earlier that experience can help with estimating things like stopping distances when one needs to do the math. 
if one doesn't have experience and no place to reference, how might one proceed? Would the artist simply move on to the next rigger who will say yes? Um, I'll let you, got you uh, Andy, Jonathan, you want to take, take a shot at that? Yeah. I mean, plausibly that artist might move on to the next rigger that says yes, or they might just, if they get a no, they're just going to do it anyway or find someone to do it. And like that kind of creeps up, I think, in like ideas that aren't great ideas, like rigging your acrobatic equipment in your home. Like your stick framed house is not going to be strong enough to, to hang up your, your Lyra. Um, 99. But, but I'm not, I'm not going to do any drops. I'm just using it for yoga. Yeah. Well, you know, that's the, that's the worst case scenario uh, thing. Like if you, uh, you know, like when your, your, your daughter starts doing yoga and then she sees something on YouTube from drops and she doesn't know the difference and she tries it. Um, the, The experience level of it and estimating the stopping distance, uh, that's thats a big, I mean, that's a big challenge. It's a big can of worms. And that's why I don't think that that shock load equation is really that useful. Um, it Measuring it has got to always be the best that um, Tansy put it in the chat, the link to that study of actual acrobats being measured is really informative and really eye-opening. Um, and uh, I think the experience is, the takeaway is that the forces are larger than you expect. And it's pretty common to say, oh, how can that, that 100 pounds, uh, you know, acrobat generate, possibly generate 1,000 pounds of force? That couldn't possibly happen. But it does. Um, and that's the, that's the takeaway. If, if, if I may add something to that. Thanks, Andy. Um, when I'm when I'm when I'm dealing with situations like this, and you know, assuming I'm not working with bungee, which has you know this huge stopping distance, the deceleration uh, ratio is really really long because it's bungee, right? But you know, if I'm dealing with a, you know kind of a straight ahead either rigging or aerialist situation, my inclination is to first do the math skipping the deceleration or the stopping distance because that's going to give me a number that is really really big and if i stick to that number if i say okay that number is 5000 all right so you know we've got to be above 5000 to make this gag work knowing that i've got a deceleration distance of you know i don't know i can't measure it maybe it's 2 inches maybe it's 6 inches um but that puts me where I in, a, in that puts me where I want to be safely. Does that make sense? Yeah. And if you combine that approach with some with one things like Marion's uh, Marion's measurements, with uh, the the Europeans have a have a slightly different approach way of looking at it, where they they're going to assign a uh, a dynamic factor based on the kind of act that people have worked out over the years uh, and that is uh, that they'll apply on top of a factor of safety. Uh, so you've got two things going on getting more specific about the act. We haven't traditionally done that so much here in the states, uh, but it's a it's another helpful way of looking at it and thinking about it. The, the punchline, in addition to what Bill and Andy said, for me is if you kind of know what's typical and you think through, you find out, and I think the drafters of the standard kind of certainly looked at this, you kind of find out that for most typical, and I'm not talking about the highest of the high end, uh, aerial performance, whether it's fabric or rope or chain, that it is typical for a typical quasi-professional performer to produce between five and eight times their body weight in dynamic forces. And you do the math and you find out that most of the time in those typical situations, I'd say 
80% of the time of the aerialist scenarios that I come across, uh, things that, that meet, even though it's not applicable on its terms, things that meet and hardware that meets the fall protection guidelines or that are 22 kilonewtons or better mi uh, minimum braking strength will tend to support those loads. They may not be the best choices and you may need more than that, but a lot of times the stuff that is out in the market for other industries uh, and for other uses will support typical loads uh, in the six times characteristic load uh, um, world. Jonathan, I got to disagree with you about one piece of fall protection equipment that I've seen people advocate for aerial use, and that's fall protection beam clamps. Like the beam gliders that are out there, I would not trust them. Some of them I might, but I would not trust them for acrobatic use because they're designed to hold at least 5,000 pounds exactly once. And then you take it out of service. That's in the standard. That's so. Good um i uh yeah that uh, other than that but like you know the fall protection uh rated carabiner that says that has the ANSI standard on it uh yeah i would use that generally speaking it's going to be adequate for for aerial performance bill you got another another question um yeah. i have people saying thank you and good night um oh, that's a good question hang on a second here um, well, Brian is asking about books that are uh, more specific to aerialist uh, activities. And he, he mentions Stephen Santos's book, Introduction to Rigging Aerialist Essentials. Um, uh, there is an aerialist chapter in my, set, my book, uh, Entertainment Rigging for the 21st Century. I almost forgot the name of it there for a moment. <laughs> um, I'm not. I'm not familiar with other books per se. There are certainly any number of articles, um, podcasts, and and the, and the like that are online. But in terms of, you know, a book. I, I, I well, so Jim Shumway's book on automated performer flying has a lot of very relevant stuff. It also yeah. has a lot of stuff that isn't relevant. But I think Brian should actually write that book. Uh, because he knows that stuff. Okay. Actually, assuming we're talking about Brian Donaldson. Actually, this was Brian Reed who asked. Oh, Brian. Well, Brian Reed knows a lot too. I don't know what happened to Brian Donaldson, but but um, but um, there isn't, to my knowledge, uh, the book that Brian Reed is describing. Right. Brian Brian Donald Donaldson had to uh, had to depart because he has to put his two kids to bed. Well, he, yes, he's in, he is uh, well ahead of us time zone wise. Yes. Um, okay. Looking Where do you want to head from here? Uh, do you have other questions or shall we wrap? Uh, well, how many people do I have left in the room? I have 36 people left in the room, unless you have, unless you have nowhere to go, uh, we can, we can stay with this. Um, Simon Howley says, and stop using daisy chains. And oh, stop yeah. using daisy chains, sure. Well, I haven't, that assumes I, haven't seen, I haven't seen daisy chains in quite some time. Well, daisy chains are used a lot in, well, we'll call them aerial yoga studios. Uh, they, if people seem to like them because you can adjust heights easily. However, there's so much information about the inappropriateness of using them the way they are typically used. Uh, and we'll just reference the Black Diamond video, which is, is available through your friend, Mr. Google, which shows the ease of screwing that up. Uh, and there are lots of better choices uh, for no more money, uh, including quote unquote daisy chains that are actually have each loop has full integrity uh, or um, uh, so daisy traditional daisy chains where you have stitched pockets uh, are, are a bad idea for what we're doing. They're not designed for these dynamic loads by Gordon. 
but the person who trained me said this is the right thing to use and I can buy it from the store that says they sell equipment for aerial. Yeah. Uh, how could this possibly not be appropriate? Um, there, there's a lot. Yeah. How do you answer that? I mean, <laughs> I, I don't know how you answer that, except. Well, don't. Go ahead, John. I'm sorry. No, Bill, if you know how to answer that, that's that'd be great to know. I, I don't know how to answer it, but it's, it, it circles us back to something that we that came up in the very beginning of this session, which is that up until very recently, there has been no effort to, you know, institutionalize or codify what aerialists do. It's still very much kind of a, a lone wolf, I'm on my own and I know what I'm doing kind of a thing. And that's changing. Uh, but to answer the question of, can I use this piece of equipment that I want to buy in, 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 in the store, um, in any other industry, including the entertainment rigging industry, you can look at the doc that piece of equipment and it'll have on the label an ANSI standard that identifies what it's for. That ANSI standard will tell you that this is what this piece of equipment can be used for. Um, we're getting to the point with aerialist equipment and aerialist popularity that I think that's going to have to, that's going to have to happen. Somebody in the, in the aerialist community is going to have to step up and start thinking about writing, if not standards, at least more white papers, more documentation for what's yeah. going on within the industry. And the same questions always come up. So it's not like there's an infinite, uh, an infinite um, pool of those questions. The same questions do. And the uh, resources are available, but they are not codified. Uh, and they are not standardized. And, and now, that, now that rigging equipment for aerialists is becoming more of, I'll call it a commodity, you can actually go out and buy stuff from vendors that sell stuff for that purpose, then uh, we have to look harder at that. Rather than the tradition of most of the stuff that people are using is one off uh, and it was either what we stole from the venue or what granddad made in the shop. You know, Stuart, you laughed at that? Yes. Okay. Good. Uh, yeah. One laugh. That's good. One laugh. It, it never happens, does it? No. Um, I mean, we, I have stories. <laughs> we all have stories. Uh, There's such an amazing spectrum of places you can buy rigging equipment for aerial and circus. And, an and I'll say an amazing array of reputable places where I can buy a reputable area acrobatic rope uh, from someone that I trust. Uh, and it's meant for this purpose, but it doesn't come with any paperwork. Doesn't have a working load limit on it. Doesn't have any recommendations about uh, how many people you should put on it. Nope, that's for the user to decide. Uh, and then the other end of it where uh, other vendors are much more act proactive about saying, we've engineered it, this is the paperwork. And then in European uh, things where you have to actually provide certain information by law. So if you're buying a acrobatic rope made in Italy, you should expect certain paperwork that comes with it. Um, none of, there's, I, it's hard to say that one way is right and one way is wrong, um, but it is an observation that that rope that came, that comes without a working load limit, that comes from a circus culture of we all know each other. We have each other's phone numbers. We trust each other. And I would put my wife on my great uncle's uh, built rope. Um, and it's a tribal knowledge. And the trouble with it is that in the last uh, maybe 20 years, definitely 10 years, that the circus arts have grown outside of the, under the canvas tent. And it's so much it's so accessible at your yoga gym or whatever. That you you run into these problems of people that don't have that tribal knowledge trying to make informed decisions without any standard. Um, and you know 
what Bill, what you said, someone should write a standard for it. I think a lot of people would agree with that statement, but not a lot of people would say that, you know, this person has the right authority to write that standard. Right. Well, there are ways, there are, there are certainly ways around that. Uh, before we get into that, though, uh, Isaac asks a good question. Um, and what he's asking is, um, well, at the end of the day, he said, where, where can he find info on the makers, resellers, organizations who do the testing and can give a more solid answer on the silks? And I think what he's looking for, and you know, me being a novice, I would be looking for, is there specific questions? Is there a, are there, you know, keywords that would be helpful in a Google search that you can suggest that either one of you or any of the audience can, can suggest that would help people, you know, who just don't have as much experience to go out and find the stuff that, um, that they can trust, that they have, you know, the documentation, that they know that the testing has been done that my, it's, you know, it just wasn't built by my weird, weird Wait, uncle. Well, it, it's a, it's a, part of the challenge is that the sellers are not always the manufacturers as well. So you have two different levels of accountability and representation going on and distinguishing who made the thing uh, from who is selling it is, is a useful thing. One of the things that I look for, and this is actually true for regular rigging stuff and figuring out, is this appropriate for the use that I'm thinking about putting it for is I, if somebody, everybody now is putting a rating, a working load limit or a, a safe working load limit or some other word that purports to say how much you can put on it. Uh, if that uh, vendor or manufacturer is not willing to tell you what the design factor is on that, then that raises a big red flag for me. So I look for either being able to get minimum breaking strength or a working load limit with a designated specified design factor or both that tell that's a signal just even from looking at google or from the 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 um cut sheet on a particular project product that uh that we can look at um to be to be clear just so we're clear here, you're talking about seeing a, a seeing this in documentation. You're not expecting a uh, a carabiner to have a working load limit and a WLL and an, an MBS. Well, on I'm, on the product itself. I'm not necessarily expecting that, but in fact, that is the way the industry is going. And a lot of it used to be true that for uh mountaineering and uh and rescue uh and tactical products you used to only see the breaking strength because it was assumed that these were going to be used by experts who would be applying their own design factor uh or their own factor of safety uh but now whether it's petzl or whether it's uh, uh, CMI or whether it's one of those, you're actually seeing both of those numbers a lot of times, uh, which tells you what the design factor that they're applying is. I'm going to I'm going to hold your feet to the fire on that one. Okay. Um, <laughs> I I have not seen and I have not done extensive research, but I have I have yet to see a carabiner or a um, uh, you know, a rescue pulley. You know. Maillon rapide. I'm sorry? Or a maillon rapide, uh, quick links, or, uh, or rescue pulleys. Yeah, there, it's happening, Bill, and I can easily pull stuff for you to show you yeah. that these manufacturers are now doing something over the last five years that they had not traditionally done. Right. I, what I, I have seen carabiners that have a working load limit on them now, but they have removed the MBS, the minimum breaking strength. Um, well, whether, whether, to be clear, 
whether it's printed on, whether it's, you know, etched into the piece of hardware itself, if it's available uh, in the yeah. manufacturer's documentation, just the same with other rigging hardware, it may not be on the piece, but but it's right there on the website or on the cut sheet. Well, that's the clarification that I wanted, that I was trying to address, because I have not seen what what you're describing on individual product. I, you know, you, yes, you can get that information. You certainly should be able to get that information from uh, the manufacturer to clarify or identify what it is that they have put on that carabiner or shackle or, or whatever. Well, that's interesting. I'll take a look and see if I, uh, I'll take a look in the box and see uh, it's a good point. I'll take a look. Some of it, some of it comes down to like the paperwork and the certifications for the product uh, and quick links are a great, a great example. You get the exact same quick link rated for people, a PPE quick link, and it doesn't have a working load limit on it. It has an MBS on it. And that's due to European norms and what the standard says should be on it. And the uh, PEGA, who makes Malian Rapides, they make the exact same thing and they stamp it different uh, and they certify it different and they'll put a working load limit on it. And it's the exact same piece of hardware. Um, I know how I answer um, like how, how do I buy, where, where's a reputable place to buy stuff? And that's to understand that rigging is trust. I will buy shackles from Bill Sapsis because I trust Bill Sapsis and I know that he doesn't sell junk. He also doesn't sell aerial equipment, uh, which, uh, which is besides the point, but Bill is not going to sell me a shackle that is a, a piece of shit. Um, I could get a cheaper shackle off of Amazon. But when if I buy it off of Amazon, I, I kind of don't know what's going to be there when I open the box. And if I'm not and if I'm disappointed with it, or if I have a question, there's no phone number to call to talk to anybody. I can call Bill. I can call uh, Silver State in uh, in Vegas and talk to someone and get real answers from people. Um, so that's that's a big thing for me. Like, you know, um, I might be able to get a way better job. I mean, like a you know, like an oil change might cost a third the price at a certain mechanic, but if he's not willing to give me his phone number, do I want him touching my, my Jeep? Um, so it's, it's a hard question to yeah. answer. When, when I want to I wanna bring up a question that Tansy Chow, and I apologize if I mispronounced your name. Um, she brought up he or she, I, they, it's an emerging skill, folks. Give me a give me a, a shot here. Um, but they bring up a question similarly to industrial hardware, for example, Crosby. The working load limit is often published, not the MBS, to cater to people who lack the understanding to use that knowledge safely. People will look at the number and simply work within the printed capacity. Right, which. That, I mean yeah that that kind of that that go uh, well and 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 you just amended that to say oh it was a statement to add to the conversation not a question um that's fine and I, but i think that question or statement uh it's a good one and i think it's 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 a debatable statement Right, and I'll just f follow on with that. And you just picked uh, Crosby as an example, but more generally for industrial equipment. One, the reputable manufacturers of industrial equipment will for sure tell you what their design factor is uh, or what their braking strength is. They'll give you two of the three pieces of information for sure. The one exception in the United States is engineered aluminum trusts and that's a whole other conversation oh, but, don't go there <laughs> i'm not going there but um but generally speaking not only will reputable manufacturers of industrial rigging equipment tell you what their design factors are or what their braking strength are there are also standards so the the hardware manufacturers you can know for example that a piece of that a shackle from 
from a reputable manufacturer working under United States standards, regardless of where that particular piece has been made, is going to have a design factor of at least five and sometimes more, depending on the alloy that it's made of. Uh, and that's, that is an industrial standard. So you can look at a shackle from Chicago or a Crosby or CMI or CM or another, and without having to go uh, dig in the book, which you can do, uh, you can know that it has a design factor of at least five, which you can apply to that working load limit. The same is true for industrial polyester, industrial round slings, uh, and uh, to various other elements, to different grades of chain, because of the chain manufacturers have, have their own standards, apply different design factors. So that information for industrial stuff is generally available. That doesn't mean that Joe's slings down the block, does, you know, who makes slings in his basement, is designing these to conform, his slings to conform with, the, uh, with those standards. But the standards are there. I think, I think Tansy's comment speaks to, um, and again, this kind of goes back to the beginning, speaks to a difference between entertainment rigging and aerialist rigging. That comment in the entertainment rigging world, you know, arena, uh, theatrical rigging, that sort of thing, um, that comment would, would, I think, would draw some concern because we in the entertainment rigging world have been trained since the very beginning. Some of us don't listen as well as others, but we've been trained that the working load limit is it. And that's all you do. You don't exceed the working load limit knowingly. Um, and, you know, and that is, in my opinion, a good habit to be in within those disciplines. But once you move over to the aerialist rigging side where things are a little bit more fluid. They're a little bit more loosey goosey, right? Um, knowing what the working load limit on a, on a product is and knowing what its minimum breaking strength is, I think become more important because it's my experience that you're gonna exceed, people exceed the working load limit a little bit more frequently. And I don't wanna say more cavalierly, but you know, they do it with, with less, you know, gnashing of teeth see i would i would i would push back on that because at least in the in the work that i do and the work that i'm mostly exposed to uh, i would say that the manufacturer's working load limit let's say it's a five times on a on a, a round sling is the floor and that mostly when we apply let's say acrobatic or performer flying appropriate design factors, we end up using a higher design factor than what the manufacturers for industrial do. Yeah, no doubt. I was thinking more in terms of equipment that is more um, integral to um, uh, aerialist rigging. I mean, round slings and that sort of stuff, they're pretty generic and they're, 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 they're cross-platform. Um, Right. So if we, so I have this picture of this broken lira up there, uh, and that d does take us back to the lack of a lot of times the tradition that that uh, these this these props or apparatus are one offs, or they're made without a lot of testing. I mean, who wants to destroy you know a lot of those if you really only want to make one uh, or use one? Um, I, th I think you're probably right uh, when we, t but when we test typical aerialist apparatus or props, uh, we find out, as you say, that they don't necessarily conform to standards, but most of them are in the ballpark of those, um, of those uh, typical strength factors. Uh, to be clear, E1.43 does not give us specific guidance on, the, and the language is paraphrasing, any connection that depends on the strength 
or skill of the performer. Uh, so arguably the design factor requirements of E1.43 as it's currently written don't apply to that trapeze. Uh, and yeah, probably some of them are don't have a 10 times, six times, three times. Uh, but mostly, mostly with the exception of fabric, which is always kind of the weakest link in the system, uh, there they may not be the weakest link in the system. People tend to build stuff pretty beefy. I don't know, Andy, do you have a different take on that? Uh, I, I guess I disagree a little bit with Bill that I don't see that it's common in good acrobatic rigging to exceed the working loan limit knowingly. Uh, and I agree with Jonathan that uh, in general, our design factors are double what the industrial design factor is. Um, the like, the, and that gets back into like, where does 10, six and three come from? My answer for six is, well, it's higher than five. <laughs> um, so, you know, the five, five is the standard kind of base level design factor for hardware. So if I'm planning on doing high loading, I should have a design factor larger than the span set I'm using. Um, and, but then that, that kind of that gray area is that peak loading that three to one. Um, and so that would be a case of on paper, it seems like maybe you're going to exceed the working load limit on your shackle. If you pick a shackle that is one ton and your, your 10 to one design factor is two tons, uh, and then your three to one is going to exceed that working load limit. Well, that would be the exception. And to me, that exception, why is it three to one? Because that's still bigger than the typical plastic deformation of uh, steel hardware, steel wire rope, which would be in the like the two to one range. Um, right. Gentlemen, I would defer, I'm, I'm happy to defer to you regarding, um, you know, working on limits and whether or not they exceed. My experience is significantly less than yours. So I'm happy to, to agree to, to, as I say, to, to defer to you on that one. Well, I, I, do want to, I think your I, point, I think your point is, is useful though, Bill, because really we are dealing with individual case by case scenarios we've i've managed to go through this whole workshop without using the words it depends and i'm very proud of that but that really is uh that really is the answer to so many of the specific questions and issues that are that are uh that we face every day in this world yeah and i appreciate uh, the fact that we didn't that none of us said it depends um but we did exceed our, our, our quota on the, the words rabbit hole, I think. Okay. Uh, <laughs> it, it, listen, folks, it is, I'm just, you know, I'm playing gatekeeper here. It's 410 Eastern time. Um, and there are still, I still got 28 people here. Um, I'm happy to go for a little while longer, but um, we need, uh, yeah, I would like to see audience questions. Um, the uh, uh, Stephen has a question. How are those liras attached to the bridge? Go back. Uh, can you go back to that bridge one? Yeah, that one. Oh, there are. We're using span sets wrapped around the structural members uh, that are holding up the handrails, uh, uh, and then uh, ropes coming down to the connection point. It's 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 uh, it's rock and roll rigging essentially. It's make it's basketing around something big and beefy and heavy. Right. I would I would I would I would if it was rock and roll rigging though it would be a steel sling not a round sling uh, around the beam. Duly noted. Well, it could have been a, it could have been in the old days. It could have been a round sling with a steel backup. Yeah. <laughs> However, well, they, I mean, go ahead. Arena rigging is pretty much formulaic. Like I'm sure there's there's still people pushing the boundaries, but you need it to be a basket is a basket in Cleveland or Detroit. Like everyone's doing it the same way. Um, you're not going to find that in circus rigging. Uh, right. 
it's very case by case. And there are definitely a lot of norms, but they're not universal. Like most people will terminate their silks to a climbing uh, rescue figure eight. Um, but that's not by any means the only way or even maybe even the best way to do it. Um, so it's hard as someone that's trying to evaluate that to say, this must be bad because I'm not familiar with it, but also to say, this must be okay just because even though I'm not familiar with it, who's presenting it to me, I, I should probably trust them. I don't know. Um, yeah, it's not arena rigging. Or this is the way we've always done it. There you right. go. Yeah, that's the scary one. When, one when of the things this is the way we've always done it and we're comfortable with it. Yeah. And that's where, by the way, the, the, especially taking into account, let's call it traditional rigging culture, there come, there's often a little bit of, uh, of conflict there, uh, particularly when, let's say, your aerialist or your aerial act happens to be young and female. Uh, and walking into a venue where, you know, none of the ringers are young and female, and they've all, you know, got this big black t-shirt that says, rigger, don't fuck with me on it, that sort of thing. Uh, uh, yeah, thank you, thank you, Andy. Um, the, the, <laughs> and in a constructive dialogue there is something challenging, and the fact that that aerialist has to uh, trust the rigor, but but trust, but verify because it's their body. And as performers, as the artists get more training and get more assertive and knowledgeable about their own safety, there's often points of tension between the rigor. You know, this is this is my house. Don't tell me how to attach. Uh, it's something that riggers need to learn. Yeah, I was just going to say that this is something that the the riggers have to, um, you know, they have to learn. They have to. It's their culture that requires some adaptation, not the performers. Exactly. Yeah, that was that. If I said it wrong, that was my point. The, the okay. Riggers, that that. But but the push for that comes from more educated uh, uh, performers who are making more demands. I want to go see that point. No, you can't go in my lift. Sorry. Well, well, also, like the fact that you want to look at my rigging means that you don't trust me. Well, that's the, that's the, the, rigor, the rigor attitude yeah. is automatically go to defense yeah. and say, like, I, like I said, the, 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 the culture, what, what, when it comes to interaction between, I'm, I'm not going to make a blanket statement here, but when it comes to the interaction between, um, rigging riggers and the rigging culture and performers uh the adaptation the, the the changes need to be made on the rigging side i agree completely with that uh, i'd also like to point out that in terms of you know the, you know andy mentioned that how arena rigging has become and is formulaic um and i agree 100 and i'll Part of that is because it's been around longer. Um, but I also, unfortunately, need to point out that a lot of the regulations, a lot of the standards, and a lot of the change in culture that has happened over the last 50 years have been the result of significant and serious accidents, you know, catastrophic accidents. Yes. Um, and that, and I, I mean, I, I think that that's both unfortunate and true and certainly relevant to the world of circus uh, and acrobatics and aerial performance rigging. An example being the, the, the push for the ANSI E1.40, what became ANSI E1.43 uh, in the aftermath of some very highly visible uh, um, missteps shall we say <laughs> so if and 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 if there are no other questions coming from the group um 
I'm thinking that um, we've, uh, we've, we've come to the end of this class. That's Eric Day is asking, when will we be able to do, oh, he's say, asking that to me. Sorry, Eric, I didn't realize that at first. Um, I don't know, Eric, that, that's not, that decision is not up to me, it's up to individual states and the pandemic. <laughs> Um, Bill, let me just say that uh, that for anybody who wants to follow up on anything, uh, I'm always, whoops, I lost the slide. It's there. Go back I'm one. Always, I'm always available, uh, and I know Andy has agreed to be available as well. We are reachable at any time. If for some reason you lose that, Bill knows where to find us. You know where to find Bill. Uh, but. Yeah. I, I welcome this kind of dialogue and conversation and learning, and I learn a lot from it every time we, we engage. Yep. Thank you all. Thank you to Andy and Jonathan. I really appreciate your, 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 your expertise and the time that, uh, you know, you put this together for us. I, I really do appreciate that. And um, Bill, I want to thank you for back. doing these, these webinars. They've been a great resource uh, uh, throughout the, the fall. And as you continue them, it's very generous of you. Yeah. Well, it's my pleasure. I'm having fun. Yes. Uh, thanks, everybody. Thank you very much.